All right, so there's some room at the front for those just coming in. And uh, you're in room two, as you know, we're going to talk about XRAT. So a deeper dive into XRAT, monitoring China's interests w abroad with, surveillance, with mobile surveillance wear. So our two speakers are Apuva Kumar. She's a security researcher at Lookout, spends most of her time uncovering and exposing threats as he emerge in and around the mobile space. And we also have Arizu Osainzad Amirizi. Um, she's a security researcher and reverse engineer with experience working in different domains of security. And I'll stop their bios there because I want to give them the floor and the time to speak to you guys. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for coming. I know it's been a long conference. This is the second day. This is a Friday afternoon. Everybody has enjoyed themselves last night at the party and are understandably quite tired. So I'd like to thank you for coming along and um, melting your brains with some Android reversing. Um, so this talk is kind of linked to the previous talk, and I see a couple of people that were there in the previous talk. So um, I hope you enjoy that they're sort of attached to each other, and you saw the big picture, you saw all of the details um, of the context of some of our investigations last time. And right now we're here to tell you about really just a particular mobile family, mobile malware family, and go really deep uh, into the Android reversing and into it, all its technical capabilities. Um, and hopefully this is a good exercise for all our security researchers here. Um, so, just to give you a quick overview of who we are, my name is Apurva, um, this is Arizu, and we are security researchers at Lookout. Our focus is mobile malware, whether it be iOS or Android malware. Um, and we spend all of our time, um, just as Kristen showed in the last slide, or in her last presentation, that we spend all of our time looking at the malware, looking at its context, understanding how it's being used, but then also just immersing ourselves in each family and trying to understand why these malware um, developers are doing what they do and why they do it, how they do it. So um, today we're going to talk to you about two different ones. Um, Kristen already mentioned XSR MRAT, so uh, I hope you guys are taking notes. They will be a test. Um, and then we will start to deep dive into XRAT, and we'll talk about its technical evolution, how hard it was to actually see that evolution um, and categorize it, uh, talk about its communication, how it talks to its C2 infrastructure, what the C2 infrastructure says to it, um, as well as some of the context around um, its investigation and what that tells us really about the malware. So this focus of this talk is really about what it can tell us about the malware, how we can use that context to sort of uh, flesh out more of the malware capabilities and details. So, XS or MRAT. If anybody could stand up and just tell me what they remember about the previous slide. But um, Excessor MRAT was discovered in 2014. It was widely reported. Um, it had two components, Android and iOS. Um, Kristen already went into a lot of detail as to why it was um, uh, built the way it was. But I'll tell you a little bit about it again for the new people in the room. So it had an iOS application, which we're not going to talk about at this point, but it needed a jailbroken device, it was, a, it was installed through a Cydia package. But what we're going to focus on today is really the Android component. Um, and that was a two-stage application. It had a sort of benign front, and it posed as a Code for HK application. Code for HK is a non-profit um, organization in Hong Kong, and it advocates for transparency within Hong Kong. So it was uh, of interest to a particular set of people within uh, Hong Kong, as you can imagine. Um, it was discovered in 2014, as I said, uh, during the pro-democracy protests at, uh, within that uh, space um, and uh, during the umbrella movement. So um, it was a two-stage Android application. It contacted a C2 server called accessor.com, which is exactly where it got its name. Accessor MRAT, MRAT is obviously mobile rat. Um, RAT, for any beginners in the room, uh, is a remo remote access trojan. So it looked like this. Um, it was sort of, when it was running, it disguised itself, and as soon as it got installed, it asked to install a second application called System Thread, um, 
basically posing as a system uh, application on Android, um, and then it would disappear into the background. So, as I said before, it was widely reported, and this is an example of a message that was received by one of the pro-democracy protesters, the people part of the Occupy Central movement, um, and they received a link something like this, which downloaded a sample of XS or MRAT. So there was a lot of um, reporting around it, there was a lot of chatter around it at the time, um, and this particular article goes into how the Code for HK organization claimed that it had nothing to do with this particular application. So it, it said we don't have an Android application and we know nothing about this particular application, which is how we know perhaps it was... It, they didn't source it, they didn't develop the application themselves. So while this reporting was go going on, me and Arzu were looking at this rat and we were trying to understand it and break it apart. And while we were doing that, we came across a different variant. Now, depending on who you speak to and how they classify malware, it's not uh, too much of a science, it's more of an art. People see different similarities and different code structures and realize totally different things. Um, XRAT is can be considered a variant of Accessor MRAT, but we classify it as a different family. Regardless of those very, very specific details, we're going to go into why we think XRAT is different, how it's exactly different, um, and explain to you, you know, perhaps some of the motivations behind the actor and how they've changed throughout the years. So we're talking about an application that started in 2014. Uh, we've also written a blog about this because I know all of you read our blog very, very carefully and uh, have already caught up on this particular one in 2017, uh, in the middle of 2017, and we've uh, blogged about it uh, extensively. It's not a new family, but it's still worth talking about, and I'll go through why. The blog basically talked about really the high levels of this initial version of XRAT that we saw and um, some of its capabilities. Some of the interesting things were exactly what you expect a surveillanceware family to be. So surveillanceware, um, Kristen again went through that in her talk previously, but it is an application that sort of targets a particular group uh, of people and uh, exfiltrates as much information off a mobile device as they can um, within the context of mobile malware, obviously. Um, some people call it spyware, but don't get the two options confused. It has to be, I have to explain that distinction just because some people will call it spyware, but look out and we, we call it surveillanceware. Uh, the interesting thing that wasn't surveillanceware like about XRAT is that the last sort of set that you see over there, which says it repeatedly downloads and deletes large files, trying to exhaust mobile data, supposedly. Um, that runs counter to a surveillance where you don't want the person to know that you're on their device, uh, but that seems to be quite a nuisance. It, it starts to raise red flags for the user. So that's an interesting point to point out about XRAT. So, Let's take a look at one of the more recent versions, and then we'll talk about the evolution as a whole. Um, XRAT, uh, in the context of a sample that we received in May of 2019, um, has sort of two main aspects of its uh, structure and functionality. It has a class called a protocol class, which is basically an enumeration, and it has two things in it. It has uh, a set of things that that have a suffix C to S, which we suspect is client to server, and another set that is S to C, which is server to client. So we call the C to S ones actions. These are things that the client can execute, actions that it can perform on an infected device, and S to C, which is um, commands that it can receive from its server. So the C2 server, or the command and control infrastructure, can come back with 45 different commands um, and tell the a client or the rat to do whatever it needs to do. So some of these things overlap, but they're not necessarily the same. Uh, what's interesting on this slide is the icons that it uses. So again, just like its older cousin, Accessor MRAT, um, XRAT uses sort of the generic Android, Android um, application to try and blend in. Obviously, that's the image for the operating system, so it can't be anything bad. Uh, but there's two interesting samples that have a slightly different picture, and the fact that they're so rare and have a different icon as well as separate titles 
may tell us something about where else we can find this uh, surveillance ware and perhaps what it was used for. The graph that you see is lookout data for when samples were acquired by lookout, um, and you can see the different spikes uh, in 2017 when our blog came out, um, again in 2018, and now we're seeing a much more consistent use of the malware. So uh, it's still being used, it's still being handled, and, and, and that's interesting to take note of. Uh, it is a surveillance ware, it's a spyware, so it's going to take everything it can possibly take from your device. And as we've already established, as Eva has established in her keynote, um, if you take control of a person's phone, you take a control of their, of their lives. So it's got everything for you. It's got exactly what websites you visited, who you called, what meetings you had, what applications you have on your device, what files you've downloaded, all your passwords, all the files, and then passwords to unlock those files, all the pictures that you've taken of your dog and your cat, and your family and your coworkers, audio recordings of wherever you take your device. These are not difficult to do. But we see these every day in every single surveillance ware. So this is just a wide range of things that XRAT can do and what generally applications can, um, surveillance ware applications can do. The interesting thing to look at this slide is um, the WeChat databases and the QQ data. So uh, XRAT is particularly targeted to people who have those things on those devices. So it could be people that are uh, inclined, more inclined to use uh, applications such as WeChat and QQ. You can probably tell that there's a particular area of the world where these are more popular than others. So, Let's get to the, the evolution of it and how we decided to categorize it. Again, it was very hard. It's running for a long time. And a lot of these categorizations, it was actually very hard to categorize based on code structure. For all the researchers in the room, you know, most of the time you look at the changes in code to try and classify and um, categorize malware. So, but this was very hard to do with XRAT. Um, the, Code looks largely the same throughout all versions. Um, there are small minor differences in one or two samples, and those are the ones that we want to focus on. But it was easier actually to categorize them into three separate categories, which we call versions. Um, and it's based on the configuration files found in the malware. So um, we're gonna look at dates of the configuration files, the, the date in which they were last modified. Version 1 was a little more like a baby. Um, its configuration files were uh, very simple. Uh, they were plain text. They had no obfuscation. Uh, they were found from, they were last modified from sort of December 2014 to June 2018. So even, you know, fairly recently. Um, there were about 3% of the samples that we observed. Um, it had some interesting anti-analysis mechanisms, which I'll go through, and it had a second stage. Um, so version two, which comes along next, is more like a toddler, I would say. Um, it was about 92% of observed samples, so this is the one that's really favored by um, the, the XRAT developers. Uh, its configuration files were DES encrypted. Um, it, there was some sort of minor obfuscation and emulator detection within it, which again, we'll go through. Um, it had some persistent mechanisms and it had some new commands. And it, we see this version up until today. It's um, quite a detailed one and quite a change from version one. Now, the thing that you have to realize about version one and version two, you can see that some of the things have, been, have disappeared. Version two doesn't have any anti-analysis mechanisms. So this is interesting. Why did they move away from that? Um, then let's look at version three. And version three is more like an angry teenager. Um, it's about 5% of the samples that we saw, and the last modified dates of the configuration, um, uh, the configuration files were from October 2017 to April 2019. They were AES encrypted, um, and they used multiple encryption keys, not only one. But you can see that actually some of the things were taken out and some of the things were put in. It's not necessarily that it was just increasing its level of obfuscation every single time. So, with that, 
let's deep dive into some of the technicalities. And I'll start with sort of the quick ones, which are the anti-analysis and anti-detection mechanisms. So the most interesting one was the self-destruct functionality of XRAD. Um, this, I believe, was also seen in MRAT. And what it did was it clean, cleaned up certain files and directories depending on the sample. It could basically wipe your phone if it wanted. Um, but depending on the sample that you looked at, it cleaned up different files and directories. And that's an interesting uh, point to make. Why was it different from... It, it almost appears like it wasn't mass-produced, right? It was each sample was kind of created that way for a reason. Um, it had antivirus checking, so it had an antivirus check, and if it found any of those antiviruses on the infected device, it would disable all of its rat functionality. It didn't want to be found. Uh, it had some emulated checks, so BlueStacks is a popular Android emulator. It looked for that. It looked for particular IMEI numbers. If, if you're not into uh, mobile devices, that's the sort of unique identifier for mobile devices. Um, so it looked for particular IMEI numbers that are linked to particular emulators. Now, while this isn't a complicated check and some emulators probably can get around it, um, this is pretty good for, I don't know, 90% of the uh, dynamic analysis engines that are out there. Uh, it also did the usual. When I say usual, it's because we see it every day. It hides its icon, it hides its activity. Um, there's nothing really on the screen that will let a lay user figure out that there's something running on their device. Um, the last thing is that it, ex it put all of its exfiltrated data, the updates uh, of its, itself, as well as its debugging logs, all in hidden folders in the SD card, probably due to size. The last thing I want to talk about is the anti-analysis mechanism. So this was really interesting. The initial versions, as well as XSR MRAT, um, crashed the popular tool Dex2Jar. If you've never reversed an Android uh, application before, Dex2Jar is a very popular tool used to convert a Dex file, which is how an Android application code exists in an APK, to a jar file, which can be easily reversed. So what it did was it had a zero width instruction at the beginning, which kind of threw off the tool and crashed it. Um, this was moved away from. I, it's interesting because maybe it, it signaled that they didn't really care whether people were looking at it. There are better tools out there as well. Perhaps the people who were trying to reverse them didn't use Dex2Jar. Um, it's just interesting to see and to get into the mind of the person developing this tool. Why did they get rid of that? I guess I'll, we'll talk about the configuration files and sort of how they change now. Um, hello, everyone. So I'm going to just jump into the configuration file. I've probably mentioned them a couple of times. Now let's see what, do, what, what, what are they, what do they include. So basically, configuration file is a file in the asset folder of the package. It will include uh, information about the server or the C2 or the command and control. Uh, it will include an IP and it will include a port. I'm not going to talk about version one of this family because as Apurva said, it was a baby and uh, it was in plain text. So there's no reason to bother you with that. Um, it's readable so everybody can just like, go and look at it. Version two, however, it starts encrypting these um, information in the, in the asset file. The asset file in this case is called string.xml. Uh, the string that is used to generate the decryption key is a double base64 in, uh, encoded string. It's hard-coded in the function that does that uh, decryption and encryption. It's called this util. Um, and the decryption algorithm that is used is uh, DES encryption. These are some of the samples of the double base64 encoded DES keys that we observe through these families. I'm um, going to go move on to version 3 now. Uh, so version 3 takes it one level higher um, in terms of complication. So uh, in this case, the file is called cons.ini. Uh, it's still located in the asset folder of uh, the package. It still includes the C2 information. However, this time, the decryption key 
is also included in the configuration file. It's the first line of the file, and second line is the IP address, and the third line is the port of the C2 server. Um, another thing to note about version 3 is some of the code is hidden in another file in the same asset folder. This file is usually called base, base.apk, base.btc, but well, the name can change any time. And this asset file is XOR encoded. It can easily be um, decoded using a key which varies across different samples. These are the two AES encryption key sets that we have observed through the samples that Lucat acquired. Okay, so now let's talk about the more interesting stuff, commands. Commands are what the server instructs the infected device to do. And um, these are the common commands across this family. Uh, we have reported these in details in uh, the blog that we published in 2017. These are typical surveillance work commands. You've seen them, um, Aprova talked about them, Chris, Kristen talked about them. So I'm not gonna repeat the information, but just take a note that these are all surveillance work actions requested from the device. Um, so now let's move to more interesting stuff. Uh, so I'm going to mention three sets of commands that Aprova and I thought we recently have seen them and uh, we thought that they're interesting. So my purpose of the talk <laughs> is to walk you through them, and hopefully at the end of my talk, you will agree with me why they are interesting, and then we are gonna make a conclusion of how they can be used exactly. Starting with the first command, it's called do intruder. So do intruder, the purpose of the command is to direct the infected device to make multiple HTTP or HTTPS request to an arbitrary host and port by changing arbitrary sequences in that request. It also logs the request and response for certain keywords, and if it founds them, um, it will report to the server and um, also logs the response from that request. Syntax of the command is like that. Um, a separator is used to separate the fields. I have memorized the name of this many times and I now forgot it. So it just looks like that. <laughs> um, section mark, okay. Uh, so um, the first field, so it has, it, the command that comes from the server, obviously it has certain fields. Um, the targeted host, the targeted port that the request has to be sent to. Um, a store path, which is a string to a file system, uh, to, which, is string, which is a path to a file system on the device. Keywords, don't be misled with uh, the, the um, S, it's just one single keyword. Um, there's a couple of flags in here, is SSL, is RAND header, and is save response, they are all Boolean type. And there are two fields in this request, that, in this command, that um, also include multiple fields. Those are request and var, and they are both base64 base encoded. So now, let's deep dive into function and try to parse this command. We are the client, we have received this. Now let's take it step by step. So first thing, we want to separate the fields so we can take a look at them. And secondly, we want to start with the more complicated ones, the ones that have multiple fields in them. So we're gonna start with var variable. It's also separated by semicolon, so we are gonna split it in the same way that we did for the command. Then we are going to generate several dictionary lists, zero to four dictionary lists basically, from this var variable. Uh, dictionary list also is separated, each field is separated by, each dictionary is separated by a colon, and it has two fields, field zero and field one. Field zero is the string to be replaced, and field one is a string to replace that first field. So, field one, if it starts with a file path indicator, which is a slash, that means that this is a file path, this is not a string. Don't, do not use this to replace the string. Just go search the device for this path, obtain the file that is located there, grab this, and just try every single string that is in that file. And they're obviously delimited by um, new line, slash r and slash n. 
Okay, so now we have a dictionary list. We, we know what strings to substitute, what strings to use to, to do the substitution. But where is this going to be applied? So we're going to now parse the second field of the request, which is called request. It is a standard HTTP request. It is uh, separated by CRL of two of them to separate URI and headers from the body. Um, if the body doesn't exist, that's fine. Then the request just has one line. Um, so we are going to refer this to the original request or ORI request as a malware calls it. So now we are going to check how many dictionaries or substitution strings did we get. Um, if there is zero, we're just going to go move to the next function. It interestingly is called Craig HTTP. Um, then if it's not zero, then we need to parse those fields and replace the request with all the combinations of the dictionaries. This is going to, going to be done in nested loop, and the malware is going to make sure that uh, all, this, all the strings are going to be replaced. So basically, think of dictionaries as placeholders uh, for the strings to be replaced. So if there's four dictionary, that means there are four places in the original request that we can replace with any string that the server commands the device to do it. Um, so next step, we are going to call Craig HTTP. We're going to pass this modified request to it as a first parameter. And then we're going to use everything that we used to generate the current request as a second parameter for information. So now let's dive into the Craig HTTP and see what happens after. Remember there was a is rand header. So this basically is going to be checked. If the server wants to add random headers to the request, we're going to do so by generating an x-forward for a client IP and then populating it with random IP address. The purpose of x-forward for a client IP, usually in HTTP request, is to signal the receiver of the request where this request is coming from. It's usually used for um, the devices that are coming from uh, behind a proxy. Um, and um, so in this case, we are replacing it with random IP addresses. So obviously, we want to hide where we are coming from. If there's no random header generation required, then we're just going to dive into the next part, which is using that request that we generated. And we will send it to the targeted host and the targeted port construct, uh, instructed by the server. Now, next part, we had one string. It was called keywords. And we are going to use that to search the response that we are receiving from that specific host and port. Whether we find this keyword or not, we are going to tell the command and control server about it. I did find it or I didn't find it. And we are going to log it with the response. And then we're going to check, is save response set or not? If it is set, we're going, we're going to log this and store it on the path construct, in, instructed by the server. If it is not true, then we're going to move to C2 uh, to, to log in everything for the C2. And this happens every 100 times. This whole function that I explained to you is called HTTP fuzz by malware. So we are going to call it a fuzzing attempt. OK, next command. Do port map, this one, the purpose of it is to direct the infected device to act as a proxy between two arbitrary host and port. It's way simpler than the previous function. It only has four parameters, two IP addresses, two ports. What it's going to do is to get the first IP and port, generate a socket, socket, uh, listen to that port, and do the same thing with the other IP address. And now all it needs to do is to transfer data between the two. OK, I was supposed to highlight it before explaining it. But um, next command and the last one that I'm going to speak about is do repeat. This one directs the infected device to perform an HTTP or HTTPS request optionally with a slightly randomized header, and deliver the response back to the server 
in a form that is displayable in a web browser. Do repeat is simple, targeted host, targeted port, two flags is SSL and is random header, and a request, again, multiple fields in the request and base64 encoded. So let's parse this command. Uh, first thing, what does request include? And let's break it into a stand standard HTTP request. Uh, we're gonna also do some trimming on it, on it. Basically means that if the HTTP body does not exist, we're just gonna treat it as one string or one line. Then we're gonna check if is random header is set, and we're gonna do exactly what we did for the first function that I explained, adding x404 or client IP and populating both of them with a random IP. So the replace function here in the code that has user agent, user agent, random IP basically does nothing but generate a random IP. So user agent is just a mislead. So now we are going to send this request to uh, the instructed host and instructed port. If is SSL is set, we're gonna do so in a HTTPS format. And then we are gonna wrap all of the data that we sent and processed in HTML tags, and we are gonna call it final red val. Um, and the next step, we are going to report to the server that this was um, being processed, and we're going to basically report that uh, final red file back to it. So now I talked about these three commands, and you already have heard me saying HTTP, HTTP request, arbitrary fuzzing, and these are the commands that we pre I previously showed to you, and these are all surveillance work commands. So one would think, what does this set of command has anything to do with surveillance work commands. We're gonna wrap this up as my conclusion. So new commands, new purpose. That's what we were, Aprova and I, we were brainstorming about because, uh, so one thing that did not, we could not get was, uh, was receiving a response from server. So basically we don't, we didn't have the, the server, the C2s that we obtained from the malwares, we tried to communicate with them but they did not reply back to us for any reason. It could have been uh, certain conditions that we didn't meet, it could have been our geolocation, but for any reason we didn't get any data. So because of that, because I have not seen any data, actual data or actual um, strings coming from the server or in commands uh, coming from the server, I cannot be certain about what exactly is intended by these three commands. However, reverse engineers always say, the code is there, just go read it. And we did read it. So the next step for us is to conclude something. There are some potentially, potential, um, there's some potentials for these three commands. The first important, uh, the first theory that we have is that an adversary can use these commands to gain access behind a firewall. Now imagine you're an enterprise company, you have all the securities, and then one of your employees is just gonna download one of these rats on their jailbroken Android device and not follow the policies of the company. Now, that device is inside your firewalls, is able to tunnel every information outside your firewall, and nobody's gonna know about it. Um, so this actually will be some, will it introduces some enterprise risk. Secondly, we, um, HTTP requests, multiple sending, fuzzing, everything that can be used to scan internal networks. Again, you have a device inside the network. You can just like try scanning, sending arbitrary requests to multiple hosts and ports around you, observe the response and try to get some information about what's around your device and basically just like, gather information about, okay, so if in case of an enterprise, what other devices are there? Who else can I get into? or what else can I do with this information? And after reconnaissance always comes, um, is there any vulnerability? Is there anything that I can exploit here? Um, what version of the IIS server or Apache server these hosts and ports are, sent, are using? How can I engineer my requests to exploit them? And the malware can just like go and try its luck. 
Fourth theory, which is not impossible, is to send multiple HTTP requests to single, a single host and port to the extent to exhaust resources on that device. So basically, denial of service or dosing that device. Now let's take it one step further. Let's assume that the malware has infected multiple devices, and now it's going to use all of these devices to send a request to one single host, basically distributing this denial of service attack and creating a DDoS attack. So the questions are, we think there are two scenarios possible here. Scenario number one, which is the stronger, is that the authors are now changing their scope, authors of Extract. They're changing their scope. Uh, surveillance where is not sufficient enough anymore, and they are adding new functionalities. Now they want to go beyond surveillance where and do other stuff as well. Theory number two happens all the time, especially when the malware has simple code. Other threat actors steal the code and add their own functionalities to it. So this could be totally a different actor, and it's, it's, it has potential for more investigation and research, basically. OK, so we processed the commands. Now let's look at the communication protocol, what happens between client and server. I'm going to take one of the client actions and um, talk about connect, which is basically the send, um, the first connection that happens between a client and server, which is basically the malware is installed on the device. Now the device wants to check in with the C2 and say, hey, I am here. And this is the information that I have. For example, this is my IP. I'm in this network. If you want to use this IP to tunnel to other hosts, do so. So the connect sends, gathers a bunch of information about the device and constructs a packet that has one opcode, which is basically telling the server, hey, this heads up, this type of information is coming your way. Next field is zero. Um, it's referred to target form. Honestly, I'm not sure what, is, what it is for. Um, third field is the length of the packet. Again, this type of information is coming your way. Heads up, this is the length of it. Be prepared, and information is going to be followed. So be, uh, be final packet um, shows the size of those fields. Uh, opcode, two bytes. Length, um, target form, two bytes. Um, Length four bytes, and the rest of packet depends on how many, what, whatever bytes are specified by the length. This is the snapshot of the PCAPs in version one and version two. Those are the fields that I just talked about. So in version one and version two, the opcode of the connect server has changed. Um, the target form is the same. The length varies. So they may not be um, sending the same amount of information to the server in the connect uh, function. And the rest of it is just the packet. This is version 3, the angry teenager. So <laughs> um, this one follows the same protocol. It has a command, target form, length, and final data. But for final data, it takes, takes it one step further. And it AES encrypted and then gzips that information and then sends it to the server. OK. Um, large amount of information and technical analysis. Um, so what we wanted to do now was to switch gears and talk about sort of a little bit of, of the context of this malware. Um, and when I mean context, there's one as aspect which we've spoken about before and which Kristen spoke about in the previous talk, which is attribution. But what we also want to talk about is what all of this information and all those small little details tell us about this, the malware itself and also about what more you can find using this information. So I wanted to give you an idea of what the C2 infrastructure looks like. It's still live today, and this is the, one of the more recent ones that's still online. Uh, now, 
the picture makes it look way more hectic than it really is. It's not this fantastic. It looks like there's actually something hiding there, and there's a picture, and there's some restricted access and some target located. And um, from translating very generally the information at the top of the page and in the rest of the page, if you keep scrolling down, which isn't pictured here, um, it seems to be just a blog site. It's, it's a website that holds certain conversations between developers of different things, uh, which doesn't really make sense, but it's, it's live and it's working. But, and this is just the front. If you take a look at some of the subdomains, uh, it's hiding some APKs. An APK is obviously an applica Android application. Um, and this was modified on the 4th of April of this year. So even if we don't know much about what this malware is doing and how it's doing it, we know it's still being handled. It's still being worked on. It's still being um, perhaps manipulated by the actors or by the developers, whether it's the same ones or not. Um, Webconfig, web.config didn't really come back to me with anything. And uh, this is a hallmark of XSR, MRAT, and XRAT. Um, the servers are very locked down. We don't hear much from them. We can, you can, and, and this is like built into the code structure. You can send a lot of data. The, the server will accept anything. You give it all, it all your data, it'll take it. But it will never come back with something, or it'll come back very rarely. Um, and, and this is sort of consistent with most of the way that this, um, the actor operates, or the actors. Um, the other thing that we can tell with the limited information that we have is the geolocation of some of those servers. Of course, that doesn't tell you too much about um, actually where the actors are. They can easily use VPNs and connect through different areas. Um, but what we did notice is there were about 43 servers that we'd seen in total. Some were online and some were offline. Uh, but 11 of those, the vast majority of those, were actually located within Hong Kong. And they were sort of a smattering around in the US. Now, you might think, well, this doesn't really tell me much. The, Actors could be anywhere, but the truth is that this is actually consistent with XSR MRAT. So for years since 2014, we're seeing the same pattern. Uh, it could be that somebody's sort of trying to hide and things like that, and these might be false flags, but it is interesting that certain things remain the same. There's some consistency there, which may suggest that it's still the same actor employing and deploying these tools. Um, then there's other smaller little things that I wanted to draw your attention to. And I'm interested to see what you guys think and what your theories might be about these things. Uh, but what's interesting is the titles of the applications. When I say titles, I mean application names. It's when you download something and install it on your Android device, the sort of words that come below the icon. Um, these titles were particularly interesting, and I'm going to take a quick look at what Accessor Emra titles said about um, the family. And as you can see, the titles are very like generic things: System Thread and System IM and System ADB, which isn't so weird, which is a little weird. But the others seem to be quite normal, right? They look like things that may perhaps be required by the operating system if you're not familiar with Android. But the one that stood out especially to the researchers, multiple researchers that were looking at XSR uh, MRAT, uh, was the second one on the list there that says code for HK. Those were about 11 samples out of the 11, 114 samples that we saw. Um, and, and that's the one that stood out. Everything else looks generic and looks Android-y. And then there's code for HK, which is probably particularly targeted at a certain set of people that are interested in that particular organization, which may lead you to believe how it was being used. So let's do the same thing uh, with XRAT. And these are the titles that we saw. We saw a lot more samples, 328. Um, and all of them are, again, these are legitimate processes. System UI is the thing that runs on Android. So if even if you're quite a tech-savvy person, Maybe it might not raise that many red flags, but we'll go into that later. Um, the one that is really interesting are the last two at the bottom there, and the rendering isn't perfect on the last one there, but uh, it's difficult to say 
what those mean without the context of the people that are being targeted. So Code for HK was really popular, right? It, the umbrella movement was going on in 2014. There was a lot of reporting around it. Um, there was so much context that you could see as an external observer. But XRAT had only two samples that were uh, whose titles were in Mandarin or Taiwanese or Chinese, some Chinese language. Um, and so what we did was we took one of those, let's say we took the last one, and we threw it into Lookout's data set and we saw what came back and we found four samples with that title alone. And three of them were the legitimate application. There's a legitimate application for a website called Lion Travel. It's a company that spe specializes in travel tours around Taiwan. And um, what you have to realize is if you're not within the situation and if you're not within the context of where this malware is being used, it probably doesn't ring too many bells. But maybe you're the person who uses Lion Travel for your tours and travels and buys your parents a family trip to Taiwan. And perhaps the people, at, uh, the employees at Lion Travel use a particular airline or have a certain set of people that they know quirks and ideas. Perhaps they uh, book travels for somebody important. Um, it would be interesting to go down these little small threads and pull them and see what comes out at the other end. And that forces you to think a lot more and immerse yourself in where these uh, malware are being used. Um, so that's just like an interesting tidbit of information, which I'm sure if you pull on that thread, if you go home tonight and pull on that thread, you might find something interesting. Um, definitely reach out to us and let us know what you think. So I'm going to summarize our little talk today. Um, I hope you really enjoyed it. XS or MRAT, we talked a lot about it. It's been reported quite, uh, quite a lot. It was a multi-platform tool, and it masqueraded as code for HK. It was a multi-platform tool. XRAT isn't too different. It appears to be used by the same people. Could there be an iOS component that we haven't seen yet? Maybe I haven't poked the servers long enough. There's obviously code similarities. They're so similar, in fact, you, can't, you almost can't separate the samples looking at the code structure. The infrastructure is still live, and it has very recently uploaded an APK. It's still being handled. It's still being used. Uh, Let's find the links that link back to that. Perhaps there is a um, Twitter handle that's sending DMs to interesting people about, hey, why don't you book your tours through this website or this app? So I guess the larger picture that I wanted to get everybody to start thinking about is that the mobile field we know changes a lot, changes a lot more than any other field that we've seen in technology. And it turns out that mobile authors may need to keep changing their tool set just as fast. And the interesting thing, looking at uh, XRAT, so there are many different mobile families that keep changing, right? But why we focused on XRAT was that they didn't only just keep changing as an increase in complexity, they kept moving laterally as well. They dropped some things that perhaps weren't interesting or weren't worth maintaining. They added other things. Some of their particular applications had some commands. Some of them didn't. So were they really tailoring their applications to suit the people they were targeting? But these lateral shifts, turns out, can be just as effective. And the way that we know that is because it's still being used. It's still being handled. It's still being worked on. It's not a dead malware family. We keep seeing new samples every single day. We've seen six in the last uh, 10 days. So thank you very much for sticking out with us. Um, it was a lot to handle, so your prize is little puppies. <laughs> thank you.